This is Taylor Hawkins, ladies and gentlemen, along with Brent Woods and Chris Cheney, the Coattail Riders. You gotta love that. Uh, making their way to the stage. Where is there he is? I see Taylor coming up here right now. There he is. What's going on, man? Good to see you. Guitar player. Oh, dude, Eddie. Good to oh. see you, Taylor. Brent, Chris, nice to see you, man. Brent, Brent and I are Brent and I are still hung over a little bit from drinking with Tom Morello till three o'clock this morning. Oh yeah. Oh man, today was a rough one, man. But I'm, but I'm starting again, so it's okay. You're back on the you're back on the horse, man. That's back impressive. The Tito's. Yeah, you can't stop now. Oh, we need Ace is spraying you down. That Ace, tell them what you're spraying him with. They could get nervous about that. Ace has already got his knee in. Demon tail. This is holy water. It's demon begone, and I get it from the woman I did my energy work with, Susan Queen, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, he uses that around Gene Simmons, too. Demon be gone. That's what he said. It's just... You know, Gene is really, you know, he puts on that act, but when you get him alone, he's, you know, he's a love sweetheart. Bug, isn't he? He's, he's what? He's a sweetheart. He's a big love bug. You got a lot of history with Gene <laughs> Taylor and the Kiss guys? A little bit. A little bit? You were saying just as you sat down, and I know because I've seen, when I've seen Foo Fighters, Chris. Oh, Chris Shiflett is, the, you're his favorite guitar player. Didn't Paul jam with you guys one night? We jam with Gene, Paul. We jam, yeah. yeah. You got to get me up there yeah, one night. Get you up there. But, yeah. but uh, Chris Shiflett, our guitar player, his go to when he does his like, Chris Shiflett guitar solo, go! Is pretty much a Ace Freely guitar solo. And he's got a picture of you on the headstock of the guitar. Oh, I he's think. got it on his, uh, his uh, yellow Les Paul. When, Ace, when you hear about... Now, Brent, who's the guitar player in the Coattail Riders here, he's told me many times he wouldn't be playing guitar if it wasn't for you. That's right, right? That Brent? is true. I saw Ace play for the first time in 1977 at the Forum, at the Love Gun Tour, August 28th, 1977. And I played drums at the time, and then I saw Ace, and I went, okay, I'm, I'm playing guitar. And that was it. So He was 30. He just made the transition. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> you, know, St you know, Steven Tyler used to be a drummer. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. When you hear that, Chris, for you was I played with Steven Tyler when he played drums. We did Wipeout. Oh, is that right? Roxy, actually. I used to go out with his girlfriend. Now, Chris is a <laughs> that's, that, that's one up. Debbie Benson. As a as a bass player, was was Ace or the Kiss guys uh, an influence on you at all? Or were you a fan? It's interesting. We talked about this earlier. I I came more. I went from like Beatles and Stones to Pink Floyd, to then right into Prague. Like yes, the Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu. I love, Gosh. I love people that are influenced by Kiss because it's so refreshing. You know, like I, when when I meet a girl that isn't a Kiss fan, you know, I want you to get to know me. Forget about Kiss. You know, <laughs> get to know Ace, the real guy. Right. So when you hear people like. Brent or or Chris Shiflett or any of these guys, they're countless. Let's talk about what an influence. Buzz from the Melvins. <laughs> you were right. How does that's got to feel? I amazing. get it all the time. I'm, look, I'm an John elder five. statesman. Who's older than me that's still doing it? Besides Keith, getting there. Tail, you know, pa is Paige still playing? Sparsely, sparsely. Yeah, I don't think yeah. Jimmy Page has talked about wanting to do something for the longest time. But he just hasn't. I mean, he it. was such a huge. I mean, I saw Led Zeppelin's first New York show. They were opening up for Iron Butterfly. They were opening act. Wow. And after Led Zeppelin went off, half the audience left for the headliner. It was so embarrassing. I felt so bad for Iron Butterfly. Hey, Ace, did you see the Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart singing? Absolutely. With Numerous times. Did you? With uh, Mickey Waller playing drums. It was amazing. And like Amazing. Proto Led Zeppelin, kind of, right? Like, excuse me? That was like pre Led Zeppelin. Yes. Was that I mean, like Zeppelin you would before know better Zeppelin? Than me. Sort of. Uh, that was yeah. a little bit I, mean, I mean, remember Jeff with Beck Ronnie, Ron, they used plush amps. Ronnie Wood was on bass. Jeff Beck Truth is like, yeah. It's like, I mean, I had, in my room, I had Jeff Beck Truth, I had Cream. I had Zeppelin one. I had Jimi Hendrix. All you experienced those four albums were like if you could play all the solos on Ambrosia. those records, <laughs> yeah. you, you had it. You were down. <laughs> you had it down. You saw Hendrix, of course. I roadied for Hendrix. How did that work? Tell me about that. Randall's Island, 1970. I snuck backstage. There was a concert there, and it was like Mountain, Steppenwolf, Hendrix. But that was when he had already... Uh, well, no, he was still working with Mr. Mitchell. I stand corrected. And uh, after about... I had hair down to here, and I was wearing a black T-shirt with a snakes good star, lemon yellow hot pants, and checkered vans. 
So I, it does, you know, in those days, they didn't have laminates. So I just like was watching the rock stars come out and watch the other bands. And, you know, they would just like nod to the security guy who was standing there. And I looked like I was in one of the bands. So I just like walked up and gave him the look like, yeah, I'm the guy. And he let me. <laughs> so after about 15 minutes, they're all going, who is this fucking guy? <laughs> so they, I, I admitted, I said, I'm nobody. But, you know, I'm fans of everybody. And, and, and the production manager goes, can you do anything? I go, sure, I can set up drums, I can tune guitars, bada bing, bada boom, bada bang. Next thing you know, I'm setting up Mitch Mitchell's drums. Wow. Did you meet Hendrix? Yes. Just a nod and a thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Amazing. Taylor, did you see Kiss back in the day? Were, did you grow up a Kiss fan? I know you're... Um, no, I mean, you know, it's funny is I grew up... Ace will like you if you say you're not a KISS fan. We've just established well, that. Well, it's immaterial <laughs> at this juncture. <laughs> in all honesty, like, I grew up in the 80s, obviously, and my uh, brother was, like, a new wave guy. So, like, hard rock was not really cool at my house. So, like, I had to hide my hard rock records. And when I started playing drums, I discovered Rush and Queen and all those bands, you know. And... um my brother was like, that's not okay. You need to listen to this Haircut 100 record uh, because that's what's cool. And, but he did hand me the police, Zenyatta Mandata. But, like, no, it, w it was like, he, like, I hear so much. I, I hear people all the time that, like, had the older brother who had the Kiss Alive record and, the, and, the, and were part of the Kiss Army. I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with... Um, new romantics. <laughs> when, when you when you said you just said when you started playing drums, did yeah. you play an instrument before the drums, or were drums your first instrument? Um, drums. Were, no, I wanted to play guitar, and I wanted to be a singer, and I wanted to be up front because that looked way better than being the dude in the back. You have the image. Oh. You have the image. Uh, you know. Um, but I, I tried to play guitar and it just seemed like homework to me. It just seemed really hard. And then my neighbor, um, had a crappy drum set and he said, sit on the drums and do this. He said, if you can play this beat, you can pretty much play any song. And I just kind of could do it right away. And it was like a lightning bolt boom, right through me. And I decided right then and there, that's what I'm doing with my life. I'm going to be a drummer. And that's when I discovered the kind of the English alter ego of Kiss, I would say, Queen. I, there's kindred spirit there. What about bit. John Bonham? He must have been an influence. Well, that was later on. But I mean, yeah. I didn't know about Led Zeppelin. I didn't know wow. about any of that. Literally, I was going from like, you know, whatever was on the radio, which was, oh, Mickey, you're so fun, you're so fun, you blow my money. Tony Mickey. Basil. You know, and like the police and New Wave and... And then, like, you know, whatever my mom was listening to on the way to soccer practice, which was, like, the fucking Eagles or whatever, and which I love the Eagles, but, like, like, I didn't have a hard rock bass when I first started. It was more new wave and stuff like that. And then I kind of slowly found Van Halen, and I slowly went into Queen 1 and Queen 2 and Zeppelin and made my way to Kiss eventually. Where did Pearl Jam fit in all, in all That was, like, about 20 years later. Yeah, that was a long time later. <clears throat> I don't know shit. Uh, your timeline, Pearl Jam's <laughs> Not, way, way later than. So these we're guys about. were before Pearl Jam. Who? Foo Fighters? Yeah. No, 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 no. No. Well, well yeah. no. I mean, a little after. Dave, Dave was in Nirvana. That, I just got all screwed up. That I just was in the Pearl '60s, Jam. and now I'm in Pearl Jam. Foo Fighters. I Fighter. remember. I remember playing at this place over here, right there, the fucking Roxy, and it was the pay-to-play <laughs> thing, and I was 17 years old. I was in this band called Heavens to Betsy. You know, I uh, think I remember that name. Yeah, yeah they were, we were huge. I had a girlfriend named Betsy. We were huge in my name. <laughs> we were huge in, on my block. And, um, and, but it was the pay-to-play thing. I don't know. You, you got to skip that. But, okay. but like when you were like 17 in 1989, if you wanted to play at the Roxy or the Whiskey or whatever, you had to sell... 150 tickets to By the you. way, they still do that. Well, I'm Not, sure. I don't know if there, I, I but how most venues still do. I don't even know how it's still they do it nationally, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, and I, we didn't sell the tickets, of course, because our band sucked. But, and also, um, and I remember getting kicked out of that backstage area. We got to play, and then they literally kicked us out. And we had stolen the name, Heavens to Betsy, from this other band in Orange County. I grew up down in Laguna. And they were backstage. They were back. They were right there, like, we're going to kick your ass for stealing our name. And we got, 
kicked out of there. It's their fault. They almost didn't copy kind of it with the other Heavens to Betsy, which is a cartoon, really. Right. And um, and um, yeah, that was my first time playing Hollywood, man. Uh, and they uh, they're still doing the ticket selling stuff. So, all right, well, we got to talk to um to Chris and Brent and uh, Taylor about Coattail Riders, which of course is uh, the new album, Get the Money, which is really, really cool. And it's interesting what you're saying because you're talking about all these influences you had musically yeah. with the new wave and then the hard rock and everything. And if you listen to the music you make, at least to my ears, with this record... The, I the wear record, it on my sleeve. It you touches know? on all of it, doesn't it? It's you really, clip, I call it clip art rock. But I think that's really cool. It, it, to me, if someone asked me to describe what the record sounds like, it, it's a little bit of all of that. You really jump in a lot hey, of different Ace, when you were going to go do a guitar solo, you wanted to sound like Jeff Beck, right? A little bit. Look, I mean, you, if you, if anybody who, who's a guitar player, if you really dissect my style, it's a combination of Beck, Clapton, Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix. B.B. King, all the great guitar players. It's, I kind of all mixed all it there, up yeah. and came out with Ace, you know? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. those are the guys who taught me how to play. I never took a guitar lesson, did you? Oh, nor a drum lesson for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out. Brent, as a kid, when you saw Ace and he inspired you to pick up a guitar, was it the playing, the image, everything? What was the, what was made the impact? Thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, seeing Kiss is a complete spectacle, you know? I mean, you just, you know, you're 11, 12 years old, just going, wow, you know? And, and, but Ace was just the cool guy on stage to me. He was the coolest Thank you. guy up there. Thank so you. That, I just kind of gravitated towards that. And then, you know, I heard Aerosmith and got into Joe Perry, you know. and Great guitar and, player. Yeah, Jimmy Page, obviously, and, and Tony Omi. My but, idol. But Ace is the reason why I wanted to put a guitar around my neck, you know. There's he's, a lot of people who could say that. I really thank do. Thank you so yeah, much. I, I'd say every guitar player in my generation. Why don't we let these guys, why don't you do these guys? I'm done. All right. You're do, uh, I, we, I don't want to steal any of their thunder. You, do you need to spray anybody with Demon Be Gone before we go? Know, does got, anybody need Taylor's got water. demons. I can see it. Plenty of demons. <laughs> but it was nice meeting you guys. All right, looking yeah, forward to jamming with you guys. Ace Freely, everybody, see him this yeah, weekend in here in Southern Good California. Good luck with the new record. And uh, thank you, everybody. We'll come right thank back you, with Taylor and Brent and Chris with more here from the Rainbow Trunk Nation LA Invasion Series XM 106. And we are back live on Trunk Nation here on Volume. Ace Freely makes his way out. And uh, now we have Chris Cheney here, Brent Woods, and, of course, Taylor Hawkins. Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders, the new album. You heard a little bit of it going into the break. We'll play you some more throughout the hour. It's called Get the Money. And, um, Taylor, this is not the first album for Coattail Riders, right? You've done this before. It's a moniker, really. Is it? No, I mean, me and Chris uh, did a couple of Coattail Riders records. The last one was like 10 years ago. And um, and then we did other stuff and. 2006 was the first one. Yeah, 2006 and then 2010. And we toured, and it was rad, and it was awesome. We had a great band, and um, Gannon Arnold and the kid. Nate Woods. Nate Wood, who's an amazing drummer. And, um, and I just, you know, we just kept making records, but I just kept making little records. So I made one called The Birds of Satan, which was sort of an offshoot of Chevy Metal, which would, was with Mick Murphy, and he's like a gnarly heavy metal guitar player and so we kind of made this sort of metal inspired record sort of and um and then i made sort of a solo record i guess taylor hawkins last i don't know about three years ago but you were on with but, me for a record I, code k-o-t-a or yeah, something? Coda. Coda. Yeah, yeah. king of the assholes <laughs> i played Kritali. you know Krit what critalis are oh no. I played critalis on it you what is a, a bass on it. i played bass on it you and play i played a lot of bass keyboards keyboard and stuff what is a critali Taylor? It's like something that's like on Neil Peart's drum kit, you know? It's like a ding, 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 right? Yeah, they're like, like little... Like the bells? Little bell kind of... Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, you guys have an in tune. They're, you know, it's like a scale. Well, so Chris and Taylor, you guys have a lot of it's history, just, right? Yeah. You guys you guys go back. Talk about your history. Does it go back to Alanis Morissette? Started with gay porn, actually. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Even prior to that. I was a greaser. <laughs> It was before that. Yeah, before that. <laughs> Definitely wasn't in the band then. It was even earlier. <laughs> no, um, yeah, no, we, we started out with Alanis Morissette, bless Nin her soul. 19 month tour, Jagged Little Pill. Tour, yeah, yeah, yeah. 95 into 96. You know what's funny? Cheney, you know this, right? Six. So, <laughs> so she picked out the band, basically. She picked me and she picked the guitar player, Jesse, and, and, um, we didn't have, 
Well, we didn't have Nick yet. Nick came in later. Nick came in later. But she, so she says, well, I've called these three bass players back that I liked. And Chris, when he first went to the first audition for Alanis Morissette. And I wasn't even supposed to audition. You didn't know any of the music and you shit the fucking bed. (laughs) And she accidentally called him back. It was a yeah. fucking accident. Did you get butt yeah. dialed or something? Yeah, How does that happen? Know, whatever. Well, that was before, you know, right, so internets far. and things. But it goes deeper than that. Like, I, I wasn't supposed to I even really... Aud- I didn't even... My friend Yogi, who... Was in Buck that's Cherry? Going deep. Was in yeah, Buck yeah Cherry. he was in Buck Cherry. Yeah. yeah, he goes, hey, can you help me audition? Madonna's got this new label. And I couldn't remember her name even. I was thinking like Alana At- Miles. Atlantis. Yeah, yeah. At-, at the time. Yeah. So anyways, he fucked up the audition. Oh, I showed up with a cassette in my car and put <laughs> yeah. it in. Yeah, he shitballed the audition. Five minutes before she I walked in. She accidentally called him back, but you did learn your shit by then. And he showed up. Then I- and he showed up and he kicked everyone's ass, of course. He's one of the greatest bass players on the planet Earth. And uh, we've been together ever since in one way. So who got the gig first with Alanis Morissette? You did, Taylor? You had it first. Neither of you guys are on the record, though, right? You didn't play on the record. No, no, we're definitely uh, interlopers. (laughs) Well, the first time I ever saw you play was with Sass Jordan. Where was that? At the, the Cat Club in New York City. Damn. That's got, that, was that your first gig? Yeah, that was my first, like, here's a paycheck. Yeah. 300 bucks a week. Yeah, yeah. And a bunk on yeah. a bus. Yeah. An old bus. But it, it would have to be significant for you because that was the first was time amazing. you toured, right? No, I, like, I was playing in bands. Like I said, we were trying to play these joints. And, and I was playing in this band, and we were, you know, were like a bad Jane's Addiction. And it wasn't really going anywhere. I was working in a music store, and a friend of mine said, "Hey, I know this lady named Sass Jordan. I know the guitar player Stevie Salas. I'm sure you yeah, know Stevie, sure." And um, they're looking for a drummer to go to Europe, and they have shows opening up for Aerosmith. I'm like, I'm in. And so I had a tryout, and the first tryout didn't go so hot, kind of like Cheney's first tryout with Alanis. And the guy said, "Okay." Um, Learn the songs. Don't just do drum solos, and we'll try you out again next week. And I came back, and I kind of got through it. And that was a lot of that – was, that was serious learning on the road. I mean, that guy would fucking scream at me like, this ain't no fucking high school game, motherfucker. Look at my eyes. And he was like – it was tough. I was a kid. I remember calling my mom crying. Wow. Like, I want to go home. She's like, this is what you wanted, honey. <laughs> So I muscled my way through the Sass Jordan gig, and that's how I met a guy named um, Scott, Scott Welch. Welch. And that was Alanis's manager, and she had, he had signed her, and he said, hey, I, this girl, she's got these great songs. She's almost done with this record. And we were, I was playing my last gig with Sass Jordan at the, um, the uh, I don't know, down the street. No, no, House no, of no. Blues? No, 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 no. The House coconut Blues. teaser. The teaser. <laughs> I don't know. The Pantages Theater. The Pantages Theater. And we were opening up for Steve Perry of Journey. And I met Alanis. And she said, hey, I, you know, I'm maybe put a band in. She was really quiet and sweet and mellow. And then, uh, like, three months later, I got the call. And then I went and auditioned. Yeah. And I got the gig. Now, Brent, where do you... Co- you... Obviously, you do Chevy Metal with Taylor. So, how does where does your history come in? Where do you start with him? Well, I met Taylor from a friend of mine, Wiley Hutt, who's the bass player in Chevy Metal, who uh, actually the great Wiley Hutt. Yeah, was friends with our friend Dange, who uh, Taylor actually grew up with, who went out with an ex girlfriend, friend of mine. We're losing people right now, bro. I know. Okay, so that was back in two thousand. So that's how I met Taylor, and then I just started playing with Chevy. What like. Three four years ago, and and then he started doing this record and asked if I wanted to be a part of it. That Brent it. is an awesome guitar player, an awesome musician, an awesome songwriter, an awesome singer, and a survivor. You know, uh, what was the name of your band? Which one? Come Wild on. Side. Wild Side. Well, is there some love for Wild Side on the Rainbow the Patio? Here too from Wild Side. There you go. So didn't your record come out like Mark's two up. weeks before Nevermind or something like that? Well, we were mixing it and it came out. I said, we're done. <laughs> we're fucked. <laughs> we're fucked. 
Hey, how about this time? I knew it right away. I did. I, I, I go, we're over. It's done. It's over with. So you're making a new record of that time, and then <laughs> all of a sudden, Smells Like Teen Spirit comes on MTV yeah. while you're mixing? Well, there was, a, there was an interview of, of them. We were mixing it with Steve Thompson and, and Michael Barbiero, who mixed like Guns N' Roses and everything at that time, Metallica. Yeah. And, and Steve went to me. He goes, oh, this is that new band, Nirvana. And I didn't know anything about them because the album wasn't out yet. You know, I don't even know if it was recorded. And they're going... He goes, they're going to be really big, and they played something. I'm like, oh, this band's big. We're, we're done, you know. And, and that's what happens. Exactly what happened. Uh-huh. But Allison Chains and Soundgarden was out before that. So and Jane's and Jane's addiction was. I mean, Jane's addiction. I think. I remember going to the heart, the Foundations Forum in '91, and I just felt the change. I knew that, like it, the change is coming. I think it, Jane's it, addiction was like, I mean, if the Chili Peppers and Fishbone. Well, Jane started it. They, I mean, they, there was REM. The there was all. There was like. There was this movement um, to get back to sort of like some form of intellectualness <laughs> in rock music. Well, I it, mean, did, it did become redundant, and you know, yeah. the fans were all the same way. They, it happens with everything. Being an enema. It's, it's, it's I think happened, everybody. It's agrees. happened with alternative rock, quote unquote. I mean, everything becomes redundant after three or four years. Yeah. I mean, you start with Van Halen, who were fucking geniuses. And then you get Rat, who are awesome, and then you go blah, 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 and then by 1989, you're like, okay, well, that's over now. We need, we need fresh blood. And, and I feel like Jane's Addiction was that first... They were for me. I mean... And Perry's You on, saw them early Perry's on? on? And Perry's oh, yeah, on yeah, the yeah, record. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I saw them. At, they did five nights at John Anson Ford Theater. And I bought tickets, and I bought them... And they were the wrong night. And I went up there and I didn't have the right ticket. Luckily, I had stolen $20 out of my mom's purse. And I bought a ticket off the street. And I got to go in and see Jane's Addiction. Perry with the corset and the green dreadlocks with the ring through his nose. And, you know, and it was mind expanding. By and They were just, they, they really, like, Put rock and roll upside down again, and 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 needed to happen, and they were the beginning of what we now call alternative rock. I guess I think for yeah. me personally, even before Nirvana, you know, um, Nirvana was the, the 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 foot that kicked the door. But interestingly open. enough, we talk about what happened with the eighties. The same thing happened with that era too. Absolutely, you had Nirvana, you had Jane's, you had Soundgarden, you had Pearl Jam, and then you, you had have Creed. A million bands that sounded like them exactly. coming out later down the line. Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Creed, um, and Creed are fine. They got great songs. Sorry, I love you, Creed. Um, but yeah, everything gets like that. I mean, it's going to happen now with hip hop and and pop. Yeah, but it's taking a long time right now. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Yeah, I think everybody's yeah, still waiting. Yeah, we're, no, way we're waiting long. for that to get cleared out and bring That's back true. some rock and roll again. Yeah, but it's not going to be us, you know. It's going to it's gonna be some psycho nut nutcase 17-year-old kid that comes out of his parents' house, you know, all fingers like this, saying, fuck you, and this is the way rock music needs to be now. And we won't even know what happened. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. Let, let me ask you about this record now. You have a bunch of different, beyond Chris and Brent, you've got a bunch of different guests on this record, right? Correct. So I want to, I actually wrote them all down because I was listening to the record before I came in here. Uh, if you can, give me a little something on, on everybody. How the hell did you get Dave Grohl on the record? I huh? just, you know, <laughs> I how'd was like, bro- dude. <laughs> I got to talk to you about something. Here, here's a guitar. Um, Dave's uh, on more than one track. Now he's Dave's got a on pretty three big role in songs. It. Yeah, you know he's like we're like, you know we. Every time I make a record, I usually ask him to come around. Uh, he's he taught me how to do this shit. Really. Now, did you do you play drums on the whole record? Yeah, you do. So did you did was there ever any thought of having Dave play drums on the track and? He never wants to. Because live, I've he seen you rather, do that. Yeah, no, we do. We switch around a little bit every with once in a while. Fighters, yeah. No, he just wants to play guitar. And I mean, with Dave, you were there. I mean, you know, you get three hours, or two hours maybe, and then you hand him a guitar, and he's like, well, what is this stupid song? Okay. It's and you, true. <laughs> you get it done, and then he's like, I got to go. And you're happy to have him, and there you go. Um, 
what he does in those two hours. But is what he does is two in those two it's, hours is amazing, and I've learned so much from him. So he's always invited to the party. Always. You ever bowl with him? He was on my bowling team a I couple weeks ago. That's yeah, why I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah. He may still be a pins in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brent, and I, mine too, Brent but... and I left him in lane six pretty late. At night. Oh, yeah. He can, <laughs> sponsored he, by Jägermeister. He that can time. go big. He's a big. He can go big. No, um, we had a great time with him there. But of course. He, yeah, that, so that's okay. So obviously, Dave Grohl's on like how many tracks? Four tracks. Four tracks. All right. Let's go down the line. This is amazing and great vocal. You're trading off, trading off vocal. Nancy Wilson. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, from yeah, Mark yeah, is on this record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny how that happened. Was I was driving down the, I wanted to have, I mean, I the record just kind of developed out of just like, just bullshitting, really. I mean, you know, like we started out recording crap, and then we're like, okay, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then I'm like, wouldn't it be fun to have some girls sing on this record? So I asked a lot of girls, and um, not all of them said yes. Um, and I was driving down the road with my daughter. And I was like, I, I want to have more. I want to do another duet with a girl, and I wanted to do a, one with the um, girl from Ber Terry Nunn from Berlin. I really wanted Olivia Newton-John. Um, for real, for, for Olivia, for real, dude. Yeah, yeah. Did you try? I tried, and I got a big no. Really? Um, yeah. But and I mean, what happened to fuck? Terry I Nunn? Her from the Foo Fighters. I'm not like. Dead. But what, what what happened to Terry Nunn? She said no too. No, we just kind of like couldn't decide on a time and a place and a song, et cetera, et cetera. We will. We'll get to it. I feel a cover of the Metro somewhere uh, in your I future. I mean, I feel yeah, something. She, I love her voice. I fucking love her voice. Yeah. Anyways, um, and I had met Nancy a couple times. We did a few things with the Foo Fighters with Heart, and we played Letterman with them, and we did a couple shows together. And I, me and Brent and Cheney wrote this song. <clears throat> and it was one of the last songs we wrote, and I just, I knew she lived up in Topanga at the time. She's moved since. And I just said, hey, and I texted my management. I said, can you get, can you get her info for me? And I called her. I texted her. I said, hey, it's Taylor. Here's a song. You want to come sing on it? You know, it was all low key. It wasn't like, I'm making a record down at the record plant. I'll send the limo to right. come get you. And, it was all like in my backyard, really. Did you do the record at your house? You yeah, did it in my backyard. You did. So it's just, yeah. hey, come by and. On like $50,000 worth of recording gear. How long did it take you to do it total? We did it like in little spurts, you know, because we did it in all the little spaces in between the last Foo Fighters tour and Brent touring with Sebastian and Chaney busy with his sessions and Jane's. I mean, we just, it was literally like. Hey, it's two years. Can you guys do something today? No. But yes. The momentum should come over, though, like in March. Yeah, I mean, once we knew we had like kind of a, a, once I knew, once we had like four or five songs in the can, and I knew we had sort of a, I mean, there's not really a direction in this record. It's pretty schizophrenic, really. But and I like that. But um, once I knew we had five or six strong enough songs to make a record and sort of some sort of direction. I was like, okay, let's go, and then and then from that point on, it was a lot more of a straight line. But every time I make records on my own, rarely do I go, okay, recording starts on December first. We need to be done by the rent by January fifteenth. It's not like that. We just we get together as friends, and you know we recorded about five or six other things that were pieces of shit. Awesome songs. They didn't suck make the cut. ass. Yeah. Differing of opinion they here from Mr. Shady. Go slowly. Sucks. <laughs> go slowly, right? Yeah, we got a couple things in the, on the editing the room floor that, that may come back at some point. I mean, there's things on this record that are, you know, 10 years old. So you also have, of course, you say you've got Chris Chaney, of course, in the band, great bass player, but you also got Duff McKagan coming in Duff. playing bass on some tracks. Yeah, he's a bro. Yeah. He's a good friend. We've mountain biked together a bit and burpees did burpees together he's a fucking strong motherfucker um fitness junkie but he's a great you know he's a great song he had a lot he, i listen all respect to everybody in guns N' roses they would not exist if it wasn't for duff mckagan that guy is so together yeah i agree even when he was untogether he was together i mean he was the guy going to all the clubs making sure you know, the flyers were in the right place. And you can just tell he's just got that sort of 
sense. But he's also got a great songwriting sense. And he he's just he's got a great pop sensibility. I mean, he's got a lot to do with all of those big, huge Guns N' Roses songs that we still hear on KLOS and Every Day and XM Every Day. He's a big part of that. And um, we're friends, and I love him. And he, we wrote, worked on a couple songs, and he played bass on a couple songs, so we throw Chaney on keyboards on those songs, and and I love him. He's rad. Yeah, he was on Good friend. Not, not too long ago with us. I make the case we may not have had this gargantuan Guns N' Roses reunion if it wasn't for him, because I think a lot of people forget he was actually in the band for about 15 shows before the whole yeah, exactly. thing with Slash happened. He was playing with that. So I always thought Duff's a smart guy. I always thought he probably was be, be putting that thing together Bridging. behind the scenes, getting in people's ears, and I think he, he was, you know, I being there in the early. End, it came to probably in some... I don't know, Axel. I've met him a few times. I think he's a brilliant singer. I think he's an amazing front man. I think he's great. Um, I think in the end, he realized I need these. having these two guys on stage with me is the real deal, legitimizes everything. It would be great to have all original members and everything. Unfortunately, I guess it just couldn't happen. But just uh, me, and Al, me and my wife, Allison, went and saw... I just talked to said me and Allison if you guys know her, um, me and my wife Allison went and saw Guns N' Roses at the forum I don't know two years ago or something 97 yeah no two yeah, years yeah, ago it was November 97 that's 97 90, sorry 2017. 2017 God get him another drink <laughs> Jesus I had too many Tito's and soda <laughs> oh Jesus anyways um and it was awesome and it was like a trip through high school with us but it was also they're still really great and Axel's still a mesmerizing front man and Duff's great and he was flipping picks at me with you know and slash they're great yeah they are they are fucking great All right, we gotta and I'm glad a, they're back together we gotta take a break we're gonna come back more with these guys if we have time we'll squeeze in a couple questions from the audience there's a few more guests I wanna go through it's a really cool record and I'm not just saying that it's a very eclectic record you hear a lot of different things like you said it's schizophrenic but in a cool way obviously I hear your love of Queen all over it which is not a surprise I don't think anybody that knows you yeah, no, I mean, the, the multi-layered vocals and stuff, yeah. and Roger Taylor's a huge influence. Well, we're going to get to him, because Roger Taylor's on the record singing a track uh, on the back end of the record, which we'll touch on in a second. The ass of the record. Let's, <laughs> let's get a break. We'll come back. We'll have about 15 minutes left to go. From the Rainbow, the album is called Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders. The Coattail Riders would be Brent and Chris that are here. And the album I'm a Coattail Rider, too, by the way. Well, you, but you're we'll talk about the that next. Yeah, let's, let's clarify that. And clarify. The record it's called Get the Money, and it's out now. So everybody go ahead and check it out wherever you get your music. We'll come back with more from the Rainbow on Trunk Nation right after this on Sirius XM 106 Volume. And we're back live on Volume from the Rainbow. And we are joined by Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders, Brent Woods, Chris Cheney. The album is called Get the Money, It's Out Now. Before we go any further, you need to clarify the I name. i clarify the name. So let's, let's hear it, Taylor. Okay, so originally... My good friend Tim Fly, Tim Clohussy, who's good friends with all of us, he called me a coattail writer because I was making a record, and the only reason anyone would give a crap about it is because I play drums on the Foo Fighters. And so he's like, oh, you're just coattail writing. I'm like, that's a great name for a band. So when we made the first record, it was going to be the Coattail Riders. And I put the record out on, um, what was the name? Thrive. Thrive Records. Think, yeah. And um, nice enough guy. Gave us a little bit of dough, put the mu put the record out, went a little touring. But he's like, I need you to change the name Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders. I'm like, but that's not what it means. I'm a Coattail Rider. I'm a Coattail Rider. Think that because I'm in the Foo Fire. Like the only reason, you know, he didn't get it. He's like, no, but Taylor Hawkins, you will sell a million records if you have Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders. We didn't sell a million records. <laughs> didn't matter what you called it. <laughs> but we're stuck with the name. <laughs> now, you wanted, as we go through the guests, you wanted to mention, Chris, you wanted to mention. I get a text from Taylor. I was over in uh, somewhere like Berlin. Istanbul. And he says, you're not going to believe who I just had a conversation with. And it was Mark King from Level 42. Because there's something about you, baby. So, it's Chris's favorite band. My One favorite. of my favorites. Is it really? Yeah. No, we love him. Me All and Chaney right. both have a... We have this weird... I, I actually saw him at the Fillmore in San Francisco on the Running in the Family tour. 
and no one knows like, what that means. You guys are yeah. hard into the what 80s new <laughs> wave, huh? Man. We've already lost them. Ta- wow. Taylor says you have to text him right away. I got it. I want to get him so on the So he's this guy. He's got the bass. Doom, 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 doom. He's like a gnarly a, drummer, a gnarly, slapper, uh, yeah. bass. You know, but me and Chaney were so. both music dorks when we were kids, so we both loved Level 42, and they wrote great pop songs. I was 14 at the time. I was you know? yeah. 12. <laughs> You know what I'm thinking as you guys are talking about this, so that would be really cool? If if you, because you do records for fun and you're having fun doing this, why not do a record like, I don't know, a missing person song, a level 42 song, and do your versions of it? Do like rocked up That's versions. Chevy Metals. That's right. our next record. Thanks. For real? Are you free real? Are you really going to do that? Yeah, then the songs will be good. <laughs> wow. Just kidding. Oh man. So do you do that with you do that with Chevy Metal? You do stuff like New Wave stuff too? Because yeah, I've yeah. never seen Chevy Metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we do uh the the, the what's what, what, what do, do you do? do? What? Well we do the uh <laughs> you know that Brent's, thing. Brent's talking with his hands on the radio. We do uh <laughs> ah, ah, you know Whatever. Brent's no, hung over. We, we, we got turn in Japanese by the baby. My Sharona my turned Sharona. in Japanese uh um, Psycho Killer. Yeah, we yeah. we we enter into the new wave world. All right, let's it's finish. All part of one big sauce. Let's go down the list of the the, the guests that are on Get the Money, and and they include. Uh, well, you said Perry from Jane's is on it. My hero. So you got him I on the track. Him. Joe Walsh is on a song. Joe right Walsh. I was lucky enough to get <laughs> Joe Walsh on a song. <laughs> pretty good you want a shredder i don't do that <laughs> uh joe i don't want a shredder no yeah you do so you know what he did he did a guitar solo in half the, half speed. half speed and then sped it up here's your shredder guitar solo asshole <laughs> why did he think you wanted I that kind know. of solo <laughs> it's all fast i don't play like that i'm like i just do a slide solo it's fine joe you want a shredder? I want Steve Lukather? I don't. Yeah, I said you want Steve, Steve Lukather. Lukather. I don't. I mean, I like Steve Lukather fine, but I want Joe Walsh. <laughs> you want Ingvay Malmsteen? You'd call Ingvay Malmsteen. But he did. He go. I got a good idea. <laughs> That's Joe Malmsteen. Chrissy Hind is on the record. <laughs> Chrissy Hind. I am. That's a round worthy. of applause out there. I am worthy. We are not worthy to be on the same song. That's for as sure. Chrissy that was Hine. a dream for me. Though. There's no fucking Chrissy question. Hine. She's just the baddest motherfucker on the planet. And, you know, that came through um, one of the ladies that sings backgrounds with the Foo Fighters on tour for um, on the last tour. And I was making this record and I was playing it for the ladies. And I'm like, I want to get, I need another lady. I want, I, you know. And the, and Barbara, one of the singers, who's also just a great musician, but she's like, get Chrissy Hine. I'm like, I can't get fucking Chrissy Hine. She goes, I know her. I played with her. Five minutes later, she goes, I'm going to email her right now. I'm like, no, 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 it's Chrissy Hine. She's not going to want to be on my record. And five minutes later, I get an email from Chrissy Hine. said, you want me on your record? Send me the song. I'm like, fuck, okay. And I like had scrolled through my eight songs that we had done at that time. I'm like, maybe this one. I, I don't know. And I sent it to her. She's like, yeah, I'll sing on it. And I'm like, do you like it? She's like, it's kind of juvenile, but I, it's okay. <laughs> and that's the way our relationship has been ever since. <laughs> now, did she come to your studio no, no, or did no, no, she no, sent no. the track in? She lives over in Europe and okay. England and UK. So, so she found it. Uh, she went to a studio and I sent her the, you know, that's the beauty of, of, uh, you know, computer rock. Um, you can do that. You can send files back and forth. This one's interesting. Leanne Rhymes, speaking of women on the record. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Where she, did that uh, come about? That Well, so our kids went to the same school, and we went to a school event that they have a lot of these things in L.A. where, like, a bunch of rich parents get together and watch, you know, pay more money to do school events. And um, she was singing at this one. And I just, like, listened to her sing. And I was like, wow, she's got a, a fucking amazing voice. And I talked to her a little bit afterwards. I'm like, you're a great singer. And then we had some, you know, friends that were friends. And our kids played on the same soccer team, maybe, maybe. I don't know, at one point. And so we met her. And I just reached out to one of my 
friends that was friends with her husband. And I said, do you think Leanne would want to do a psychedelic stoner prog rock song called See You in Hell? Done by a coattail rider? Done by a coattail rider. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, fucking, why not? And she came over and she was super rad and she's a super cool lady. And her husband's really cool, Eddie. And he's like the handsomest guy in the world. And my wife's jaw just dropped to the ground along with everyone else. And uh, But he's a really nice cat and super cool. And they, she came over and, you know, it's a funny thing when you don't know someone and you start cutting tracks with them, especially vocally. It's it's kind of invasive and it's personal and like, you know, someone steps up to a microphone and you don't really know this person. You're like, well, the lyrics go like this and you're just getting to know each other. And then usually, as it was with Nancy, as well as with, um, with Leanne, I, mean, I know Perry, so that was, that was easy. And I know Dave, that was easy, but... But and I, Chrissy obviously was somewhere else. But I remember with Leanne, like we had to get comfortable. But by the time she knew I was on the level and she was on the level, it was all good. Then we just had fun, and then we're just just musicians, just having fun together. And you know, that's what to me. If there's anything that this record represents, it's the sound of a bunch of people getting together, just not. No one's going to buy any mansions from this record. Right. No one's going to... I mean, I don't think there's going to be a Grammy involved. Right now, Brent and Chris are like, well, really? Brent's like, what? Really? <laughs> Wait, hey, what, 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 what's I leave going on? Said, you know, but... but Janie's going to join Level 42. Yeah, He's like, I'm right, out of here, man. Uh, exactly. <laughs> That's right. I, you know, in all seriousness, um, it's the sound of a bunch of friends getting together and, and making music and you know it's fun it's the way fun. we recorded her vocals too we were just in the room sitting down on the carpet like, oh yeah that was funny me. Leanne's like can I take off I, I can't sing with my shoes on I'm like okay and I have to take all my jewelry off I'm like okay and I can't stand like you know in the studio there's like this microphone this great Neumann hundred thousand dollar German microphone and she's like, can I just take that off the stand and lay on the ground and sing? I'm like, okay. And she did. And she could get these weird notes. Up. She's like, if I, had, I get this note, if I stretch my back this way. She was like amazing. a yoga class. She was rad, though. She was super cool. All right, we're going to run out of time. We got oh, like right, three right, minutes. You know, so, Taylor, we should talk about real quickly. I was up in Portland with... Okay, this, yes. The oh, album, oh, yeah. the, the, yeah. the fairy yeah. dust on this record was supplied by... The great, the Sylvia great Matthews. Sylvia Matthews. mixed the record. Yeah, yeah, she mixed the record and she took it to a whole new level. I and gotta ask you before we run out of time about Roger Taylor. Obviously, you're a, a, he's a nice queen guy. fanatic. Um, getting having him on and having him sing. He doesn't play drums, right? He no. just sings on the record. Yeah. So I, I imagine just over the years you've built a relationship with him and you called him up. Stalk. And it's a cover I think it's more of a stalker situation. Like, yeah. <laughs> And it's a cover of Shapes of Things, which is the only cover on the record. Steve Jones is on it. Pat Smear is on it as well. Why did you decide to do Shapes of Things and have Roger Taylor sing it? Well, actually, Shapes of Things, the, the, the original um, rhythm track, me and oh. Chaney and Gannon, the, the first guitar player for Coattails, we cut that live 10 years ago. And it was sitting in the can, and I forgot about it. We are going to use it as a B-side, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know, I was listening to a Van Halen record, and I'm like, well, they have covers on their record. And I didn't really have another good song. And I was like, well, wouldn't it be kind of cool? And there's something about the Jeff Beck group Truth that really, to me, signifies like what a great... I mean, there was Cream in the Hendrix experience before, so obviously there was... A, lot leading up to that but there's something about jeff beck truth that is just like the proto hard rock band rod stewart singing ron wood playing drums jeff beck playing guitar and the shapes of things their version of it which is a cover of the yards bird uh, the Yardbirds, right. um is it's it's just electric two quick things and so yes i asked roger taylor would you like to sing on it he said, no, not really, but he did anyway. <laughs> Are you going to be able to do live shows, you guys? No. None? I don't know. I hope so. Well, we'll... <laughs> <laughs> Roger, 
great. <laughs> Brent and Chris are like, I know. Right. Well, I got to go to our mansion. Uh, so there goes uh, the this, mansion. There, there goes, goes the Chris. condo. <laughs> Chris is going my back rent. to Brent's looking at more time yeah. on the road with Sebastian. Yeah. Oh my right. God! What I mean, the we're hell? all super busy, you know. Foo Fighters. You're doing a Foo Fighters record started. now, yeah, right? We're already in the in the process, so we're gonna hopefully do a you know a Kimmel and a TV show. And but I think that this is the kind of band that could tour out of cycle. I gotta go. They're running. They're cutting me on time. So Thank you guys. Great here. to see you. you. Get the money is the Thank name of the John album. Stuff. Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders. And thanks to Ace Freely who was on earlier. Thanks everybody at the Rainbow. We'll see you next month for a Christmas party. Details coming. Thank you. Say